Actually, I'm kind of bored at home. Oh, really? <laughs> Just between you and I. How are you? Are you traveling much? I'm actually on the road right now. We're actually on vacation, so I'm in a hotel. Uh, but uh, the family's all doing their thing for our little chat here. Uh, but most but most days, yes, home. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's quite a change. It's been it's been really interesting, and it's it's uh, it's such a treat that Matt forced us together to have this conversation. Just because I think your message is always important, but it seems like it could even be more important now. Yeah. I think that there's a lot of folks that are really tuning in like they have it before because of all the stress that this has put on people. And it's the chronic so. stress. It's the, it's, it's the long-term just chronic stress and it's the interface where safety and mental health are really meeting. And, yep. and it's the multiple, it's the multiple crises. It's crisis. Is that plural of crisis crises? I think, I think so. that works. Let's, let's go yep, with that. that. <laughs> but, you, but you've got the pandemic, which is plenty. Then you've got the economic crises, which is kind of a complexly coupled but separate crisis, and then and you've sometimes got sometimes clashing with the pandemic yeah. crisis. Oh, yeah. ab- absolutely, mm-hmm. absolutely mm-hmm. crashing, uh, clashing almost all the time. And then you've got this third psychological crisis that's that's you're just seeing manifested in so many different ways. <laughs> Hey everybody, Todd Conklin, Pre-Accident Investigation Podcast. How are you? Here's hoping you're grand as the summer, as crazy as this summer has been for those of us in this hemisphere, it's, it's, it's coming to a nigh. It's been hot and creepy and horrific, and now I'm kind of sad it's over. I don't even know how I feel about all this. God, ew, ugh, I'm, I'm just a, a well of contradiction and emotion. That's what I am. It is uh, the podcast today, and today is a uh, kind of a special treat. This was kind of hard to arrange, but really worthwhile. I'm so glad I did this podcast with my friend Sally Spencer Thomas. Um, this is maybe one of the more important messages that will come shooting out of my lips on this podcast. And it's one that is, is not often talked about uh, and it should be, it definitely should be because it's, it's, it's a big stinking deal and we need to be really aware of it. And this is really thanks to Matt Comfort and Matt, thank you. You Quanta guys are so sweet anyway. And Matt hooked up Sally and I, um, to chat and Sally Spencer Thomas, Doctor Sally Spencer Thomas, it, she'll introduce herself. Of course, is a psychologist who specializes in suicide, and uh, and the crazy thing about this topic is that this is not an unusual event in our workplaces. It's it's normal, and if you've been around long enough, there's a pretty good chance this has touched you Uh, and it it certainly has for me in my personal experience, absolutely professionally working in the maritime industry, big problem with this working in transportation, big, this is a problem and it's a problem that we, we're not good at. We we don't, we don't know how to talk about it and, and, and it's scary to us. And that's really what this podcast sort of tackles it's it's just a chance to to uh to really sit and listen as sally and i chat about the importance of this and really the the confluence the meeting point that's existing now between wellness health safety reliability and resilience and how catastrophic failure whether it's an accident or a suicide is in fact catastrophic failure and the importance of weak signals the importance of listening and learning uh, diversity of opinion, all the things we talk about in our normal everyday hazard work, believe it or not, is pretty applicable in this topic as well. And it's a topic we need to just, we need to freely be able to talk about because it is so covered with emotional weightiness and it, it's so taboo and verboten and people don't want to talk about it, but we have to. 
And that's what this conversation does. It's important because it's something that we need to build into our vernacular and think about as a capacity in our workplaces. It's also important because this isn't, it's, we're not going to be, it's, this is a topic. It's not sad. Sally's story is profound and how she got to this area involves a, a, a remarkably tragic story. But in dealing with it in our conversation, we talk about it pretty openly. And, and, and I think with little fear and that's how I want you to feel about it as well. So that's, that's what today's podcast is going to do for us. I hope you're doing well. Uh, I sure appreciate having you listen to the podcast. Thank you. Tell your friends, subscribe, do all that normal crap that I'm supposed to tell you every time. And I never remember to do, but I'm supposed to. So uh, at least I know that I have this burden that I carry that I don't do very well at. Mostly keep building community. Keep talking to each other. Boy, this is, it's really true when you listen to this conversation that Sally and I have too. this, this idea that we are here to support one another is really valuable. The biggest lesson I've learned really in my lifetime has probably been the importance of generosity. And I, I like the idea of generosity because it means so much more than just giving people money. It's, it's a lot more. And, and that is, idea of generosity and kindness and support and listening and empathy. Those are things that are missing a little bit in our world, at least in the United States. We're in the midst of a crisis. As we talked about in the introduction, it's important for us to understand our resources. And that's exactly what happens here. So without much further ado, let me take some time and introduce you to Dr. Sally Spencer Thomas and the conversation we have on the Pre-Accident Podcast. So I'm a psychologist by training, and I loved learning about psychology. I loved learning about human behavior and how people thrived and what made people suffer. And I loved listening to people's stories and their resilience. But as soon as I got out of graduate school, I realized I did not love being a therapist. Uh, I was working at a university primarily during that time and found my way into other jobs related to psychology, like health and wellness and leadership development. And then in 2004, my younger brother, Carson, died by suicide after a pretty fierce battle against bipolar condition. And that got me very focused on suicide prevention. Our family and some of his closest friends formed a nonprofit in our acute grief to do something to prevent what happened to Carson from happening to other people. And we learned a lot of things in those early days. I learned that the majority of people who die by suicide, about 80% are male. Most, most of those folks have never stepped foot in any type of mental health service. They just kind of white knuckle it. They have one attempt and it's fatal. And so we learned and thought really quickly how to be bold in this space and do gap filling work to prevent what happened to Carson from happening to other people. And we developed a campaign called Man Therapy, mantherapy.org, that uses humor to reach men who are in despair and help them to get upstream or think more proactively about their mental health. And we also de developed the nation's first workplace suicide prevention program called Working Minds. It was a slow go at the beginning. There were not a lot of people who were interested in suicide specific workplace initiatives. There were wellness issues, wellness events and other types of mental health things happening at workplaces, but not suicide specific efforts. Uh, it wasn't until the CDC started coming out with data that ranked industry by rates that we started to get a lot of traction and started to really get a lot of calls about, please help us. We had no idea that our people were suffering in this way. And now we're really working across a number of industries to help workplaces make suicide prevention a health and safety priority. We also just uh, launched the nation's first set of guidelines for workplace suicide prevention, along with the American Association of Suicidology, the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention and United Suicide Survivors International. So we're really excited that workplaces and professional associations are leaning into this conversation so that we can save lives. 
it's so vital and yet workplaces my my feeling is is that workplaces don't really know they they want to be actively involved in this but they don't really know what their role is or how to do it and and it sounds like that's the part you're helping them sort of overcome is is that yeah. fair that transition oh, into that's totally their fair. role mm-hmm. Yeah, I remember the early days when we would be reaching out and trying to get workplaces involved and they'll be like, no, 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 that's a medical issue. You know, those people, they got to take that up with their doctors. And I was like, but they're not. And they're working here. I can promise you, uh, especially in the larger companies that were male dominated, I said, I promise you, they're here. And uh, they're among your workforce. They're just not out because they're afraid of having consequences uh, and they're not reaching out to their healthcare providers. So you have an opportunity here to really make a difference. But again, they didn't think it was their issue because they didn't have, they didn't have the right data. The Bureau of Labor Statistics, you know, showed an increase in suicide death at a work site over the years, a pretty significant increase, but the numbers were still small compared to other forms of workplace fatality. So again, it wasn't until we got the bigger picture of industry suicide rates that, especially construction, extraction, transportation, manufacturing, uh, public safety, a number of these male-dominated workplaces in particular started to really get interested in doing something. How, how did you help them build that bridge? Stories and science. So nice. stories because there we had a couple of early adopters that leaned in. Usually the way people come in the door of this conversation is tragically they've had a suicide death or a near miss and they're stunned. They didn't see it coming. They don't know what to do and they don't know how to help the grieving workers left behind or they don't want this to happen again. Uh, and so when we got those early adopters, they started to see when they opened the door to the conversation, a flood of information would come in. And they would say, you know, we had no idea. We had no idea how many people were suffering or how many parents were worried about their children or that our EAP was so broken. We had no idea our employee assistance program. Uh, so then they started telling their stories of how being doing comprehensive and sustained work in this space has made a huge difference, not just in preventing suicide, which is hard to measure because it doesn't as big of a problem as it is, it really doesn't happen all the time to a single community, but the people reaching out, we could see that change. We could see the change in culture as people were caring about each other and looking in uh, compassionately to one another. And we had individual stories of people who had been bereaved by suicide or people who had lived through a suicide attempt. So to help companies visualize what this looks like, Tell me what an early program starts to look like within an organization. The first step we recommend is really a listening phase. Again, most people don't know what's happening because they haven't asked the right questions or spent time listening. And suicide is understandably a hard topic to talk about, especially if you're worried about unintended consequences of discrimination or you know, not being treated the same. So we create opportunities for workers to weigh in with some protection of their privacy. So either through surveying or anonymous interviews with us or focus groups where they can talk about what's driving distress and despair, what's helping, what are the strengths of the company, what do people think about the resources, what do people think about how leadership is managing the culture around developing a caring community, And we walk them through their ideas on what they think are priorities within the nine practices of the national guidelines. And from that, we serve that information back to the leadership. And we say, here's what your people told us. Here's where things are going well. Here's where there's some gaps. Here's some suggestions on next steps. And the priorities are really around what what the people are saying is needed. So often there's a, a training component. A lot of times people are are very focused on training as a way in, uh, and, but we really encourage them to say, this is not a one and done type of issue. You can't do this one time and think it's fixed. It needs to be training that's dripped in over time throughout a person's career and different roles and, and different 
um, leadership types of trainings and so forth. Uh, and then usually there's a communication part, a resource audit, a, a policy audit, lots of different pieces that come into play. Uh, but usually it's that listening part that kind of sets us up for success. And, and support. I mean, one of the things I think companies may feel or managers may feel is is under the uh, guise of don't ask questions you don't know when, you don't want to know the answers to. Mm-hmm. What what happens if they discover something? Our support systems are available. I mean that that part is really it seems vital, but that seems a little bit scary to a company maybe. Right. Uh, well, they, the questions we ask in the interviews and focus groups are are you suicidal today? It is more, what do you think about the resources? Do you know of the resources? Uh, what has driven your distress and so forth? But yes, there is, uh, you know, just like if someone was to have a heart attack on the job, you would want to make sure that there is somebody nearby who knows CPR, that there's an AED there. Yes, it's scary, but we also have lots of things in place that can really help with that kind of crisis. So similarly here, one of our you know main parts of our coaching around what to do and how to set things up is to make sure that their employee assistance program is responsive, is adequately prepared, uh, make sure that they know where the crisis resources are and how they work, make sure that they know where addiction treatment recovery centers are and whether or not they're effective because there's a lot of predatory uh, groups out there. So we want to make sure that their safety net is in good shape. So if someone does raise their hand and say, I could really use some help, it's streamlined. They have confidence in where they're sending someone. They have, they could do a warm handoff because they are, they have familiarity with the resources and it goes a lot better. Uh, So yes, um, companies are realizing that this is an important piece of their safety program because, because of the the increase in rates and also not just suicide, but also overdoses. Um, People are seeing increased overdoses at work and among their workforce. And these things are very tied to uh, suicidal despair. If you had one piece of advice to give to a company, what would it be? Be bold, lean in uh, and, and take a step towards doing the right thing here. Uh, Either you'll, you'll pay now or you'll pay later. So it's better to come up front and, and try to figure out where the where the gaps are, and it's usually not that complicated to put some things in place to help alleviate this despair and respond effectively when people are in distress. I'm so glad you're doing this work. Thank you so much, Todd. It's been a pleasure to be here, and thank you for sharing this really important message with your listeners. Dr. Sally is the energy and and passion she has around this topic obviously comes from uh, a place in her own life, but also has become so much more. And I, I just really appreciate her approach. I learned so much and I promised her one thing that I would talk about these nine practices because I think the nine practices really are places where I want you as a professional in the field globally, wherever you are, based upon what we've talked about, to really think about and and these nine practices these are nine areas of attention maybe that's a good way to to talk about that that we ought to be thinking about the first one is leadership are we cultivating a caring culture that's focused on community well-being do we have a culture that really thinks about the total person Second practice area is we should assess and address job strain and toxic work contributors. So do we know the strain and toxicities that exist in our workplace at all levels? And have we asked questions to begin to learn and understand that? Thirdly, communication. So we want to increase the awareness of understanding suicide and reduce fear of suicidal people. They're, they're, they're not to be afraid of. They're to be talked to. The fourth one is the idea of, of self-care orientation. Are, are, we, are we building an appropriate amount of self-care? Do we have self-screening? Do we have stress inoculation or crisis inoculation planning? Have we built capacity 
really for some type of, I hate to use the word, but a balance between work and life. Fourth area of practice is training. Have we built a stratified suicide prevention response program? Do we have a strategy? Do we have a plan for this? The next one is peer support and well-being. Do we have formal initiatives for peer support and well-being? And do we encourage informal initiatives? The next one is mental health and crisis resources. Evaluate and promote these. Think about the effectiveness of your EAP. Think about overall wellness. Think about the intersection of where safety and reliability meet wellness. It's hard not to think about that after Sally's discussion and the current context we're in as well. The eighth one, are we mitigating risk? So do we reduce access to lethal means and are we addressing legal issues around that? So have we have we thought about mitigating risk? Have we thought about the potential and have we created an environment um, where that's important? And then the ninth one, the last one, is what is our capacity for crisis response? So do we have accommodation? Do we have restoration? Do we have reintegration? Do we have postvention, like intervention only at the end, postvention? All of these nine recommended practices are vital. And things we ought to be thinking about. And this information is available. And I would encourage you as an organization to think about it in great detail. The challenge is, we live in a world that would rather not think and talk about this, but we have to. And they're not scary topics. They're very real topics that if we listen enough and create enough concern, weak signal indicators are there. And that's valuable. I can't thank Sally enough. She's remarkable. And, What she shared with us, I think, is very valuable, if for no other reason than this. It introduces into our dialogue another very important catastrophic failure modality that we should be hyper-concerned about. We need to have capacity in our organizations to think about the whole worker, the wellness of the worker, the mental health of the worker, and the effectiveness that we as an organization have and the role we play in creating an environment where people can succeed. That's what we do. That's our job. And the opportunity to spend time talking about it today, worth its weight in gold. Thanks for your attention. Learn something new every single day. I know you did today. Have as much fun as you possibly can. Be kind to each other. That's incredibly valuable. And for goodness sakes, be safe.